Good morning. Good to see you guys. <clears throat> we are starting a new series this morning uh, called Rooted. Um, there's a clue right behind me there. If you weren't paying attention, there it is. And uh, we're going to do a five-week series uh, starting today, uh, really going through our core values as a church. What makes us who we are? Why do we exist? What is FCF? You know, as we enter into a new year and, and a transition period, they're, they're inevitably, inevitably there are things that are, are going to change. Some of them are going to be small things. Some of them will be a little bit bigger things. Some of them will think are big but are actually small and vice versa. Some things we won't even know about. Uh, but there will be some things that, that are going to change. But, but one thing, or I should say four things as we go through these next five weeks, is not going to change. And that is, and that is who and what we are rooted in, uh, Jesus Christ. And, and, and um, as we go through the next four weeks, you know, we're going to go over our, our core values. The first one is that we, as a church, are committed to teaching Christ boldly. That's, that, is, that is a core value of, of FCF, of what we do um, and why we exist and what we're here, something that makes us distinct. Not that no other church teaches Christ boldly, but we do. Uh, and it and, uh, means we're not, we're not ashamed of it. We're not going uh, to go around it. We're not going to cover it up or, or try to make it anything um, other than it is. We, we are here to teach Christ boldly. Another thing is that we... We are here to encounter Christ passionately. Uh, when I believe, and we believe here, that if you truly encounter Jesus, it changes everything. It, it's, it's not just a, uh, oh, I, I, hey, I met a guy, you know, or, oh, yeah, a long time ago I, I said a prayer, and, you know, uh, that, that was cool. But if you truly encounter Jesus, it changes, it changes everything, and it brings about a passion. Because if we understand who he is and what he's done and what that means to us, it, it can't help but ignite a passion within, within us. Our third core value is that we live Christ relationally. Uh, we're evangelical. We, we believe that the world needs to know the message. We, we believe that we have been called to spread that message and to share the gospel. Uh, and the way we do that is we, is we live Christ relationally. Um, it's, it's not something we do privately in our own homes, right? We're, we're, we're Christians. We're believers. We're, we're ambassadors of, of Christ. Uh, and so we're, we're going to do that, and we're going to do it boldly. And then finally... Uh, a core value of ours, the distinction, is that we serve Christ faithfully. We, we, we are here to serve Christ faithfully, not just within this building and within these walls, but in our community and on our planet. We are here to serve Christ uh, faithfully, not, not just when it's convenient or when we like it or when we want to or when we have spare time, but always in everything we do and what we're about, we serve Christ faithfully. So these are, these are our core values. These are not new. These are not things we've just come up with. These are, these are things that we have been about for, for a long, long time, and these are things that are not going to change no matter what. Um, and it, it is who we are and what we're about. And all of those things, if you were paying attention, are, are anchored in one thing. Teach Christ boldly, encounter Christ passionately, live Christ relationally, and serve Christ faithfully. What's, the, what's it anchored in? Christ. It's anchored in Christ. And the, the passage that we're going to be kind of going back to for the next uh, five weeks is Colossians chapter 2. And so we're going to be in Colossians chapter 2 this morning to give us sort of a foundation of that um, as, we, as we look back you know, over the next four weeks uh, and, and being anchored in this passage. Uh, so I think it'll serve us well. Um, before we, we jump into it, feel free to go ahead and turn to that. Um, we're going to be in, in chapter 2, verse 1 through 9, um, but we're not going to start out there quite yet. First, we're going to kind of give a little background to the book of, of Colossians. Uh, it's important to know the context when we read scripture. You know, we can just pick up uh, the Bible and just read a random verse. And when we read it out of context, uh, at, at best, it doesn't make sense. At, at the worst case, we turn it into something it doesn't say at all. Uh, so we want to we kind of look at the context of, of uh, the whole letter. Why did Paul write it? What was going on at the church, in, in, you know, at the Colossian church at the time? So, First off, um, you may be surprised to know that Paul did not plant the, church in, the Colossian church. He didn't plant it. I know a lot of times we're like, oh, Paul planted it, right? Didn't he plant every church? Uh, he didn't plant this one. Uh, this church was, was planted by or started by a guy named Epaphras who heard Paul preach the gospel in Ephesus, which is about 100 miles away uh, from Colossae. And, and uh, Epaphras heard him preach it. He went back to 
uh, his town, and he said, hey, guys, you got to hear what, what I just heard, and uh, spread the gospel, and a church began and grew um, because of that. And, and so this is, this is the context of Paul. He's writing a letter to a church that he's never been to. He didn't start it, but he's hearing things about what's going on. And uh, we don't know for sure what his relationship was with uh, Epaphras, but one of the reasons he was writing the letter, one of the reasons was to kind of lend some credibility to him, saying, hey, guys, look, the gospel that Epaphras heard is true. It's correct. Uh, he, he's got it right. This is, this is what we believe and what we follow. And that was simply that, that Jesus Christ was born a virgin. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross, and he rose again three days later. And because of that, if we believe in that and accept that and trust in that, we can be forgiven. And there's nothing more to it. Right? It's not, it's not uh, if we believe this and do that, or if we believe that and do this. If we, it, it was, this is the gospel. Jesus Christ is perfect. We are not. He lived a perfect life. He died in our place on the cross, rose again and conquered death, and, and we are now in him if we trust that and accept that. And believe it, that's the gospel, right? That's it. And, and Paul is saying, this is the truth. And what the gospel that Epaphras has brought to you is correct. And, and then another thing that was happening in the church, uh, from within the, the Colossian church, there was, there was what, what I'm going to call sloppy theology started seeping in. And sloppy theology, uh, we're going to talk about that quite a bit this morning. Uh, it may start out as this seemingly harmless thing, but when it takes root, it causes lots and lots and lots of problems. So some of this sloppy theology that was creeping in uh, was, the first thing was a, sort of an early form of Gnosticism. And what Gnosticism is simply, and, and this wasn't Gnosticism, but it was an early form of it. Gnosticism is basically that you can, you can, can be saved, you can um, go to heaven, you can be forgiven, you can whatever it is, because it's not even really uh, the, the, the right framework, but you can know God and, and know all you need simply by learning. Seems by studying enough. If you know enough about God, then that's all that matters. Right? This is what, and, and then you add into it, well, and you be good and you do some good things, you throw in some nice works, and, and, and it, it becomes more of an academic pursuit. And if I understand enough about God, then uh, I'm saved. Right? Which is completely, completely false. Uh, it, that's, a, that's a total lie, and, and it's something that still is prevalent today. It hasn't gone away. So this sort of thing started to, to sneak in. Uh, along with that were some old Jewish traditions and customs started to, to, to kind of rise up within the church, right? Because there was that, the culture that they were in. So some people were saying, hey, you know, yeah, Jesus is great and we believe in him and all that stuff and it's good. But, you know, we also should probably do these old rituals. You know, these, we, should, we should partake in these, you know, in these rituals and these, you know, traditions and all these things. And we should say this stuff and we do, the, do this and that. And, and, and those things in and of itself weren't necessarily bad, but when, when what they were doing is they were saying these are necessary to be a true Christian. Right? And that is problematic. It starts to add to what is necessary for salvation and, and completely um, starting to deteriorate what Christ did on the cross. It's diminishing what he did, uh, which, is, which is everything that needed to be done. Right? So these traditions started to, to sneak in. And then, and then just plain worldly pagan cultural traditions, just sayings of the day, things that people started, you know, believed, um, common sense stuff, you know, uh, fortune cookies, you know, whatever, all that kind of, those little things, you know, like, oh, hey, this must be true. It makes me feel, feel warm and fuzzy, so therefore I believe it, um, started to, to sneak in. And, uh, and people were kind of being led astray by what Paul calls lofty arguments, right, and worldly wisdom. And this is not, again, this is not like something new, or, or this is not something that, that was isolated to, to that time. It's something we deal with now, um, do me a favor, raise your hand if you have a Facebook. I'm raising my hand, I have Facebook. If you haven't friended me, come on, man, what gives? There's a lot of people, a lot of people have a Facebook. There's nothing wrong with Facebook um, in and of itself. You can do some, you can get in trouble with it, you spend all day on it, which reminds me, I need to check my Facebook. <laughs> you bring that up for me. Uh, <laughs> so, but if you're on Facebook, I think you know what I'm talking about. You can put... You can put any kind of saying, like little, you know, warm, fuzzy, pithy little saying on a picture of a cat, and you'll get 7,000 likes. And, and, and it's true, it's hard if you, you know, you read this little saying, like, oh, that makes me feel warm and fuzzy, and that, cute, that cat is so cute, I'm just going to like it. And then it sp spreads like wildfire, right? Um, 
So be careful anytime you click on a picture of a cat. Just as a good rule, just stay away from those. So we live in a culture that is riddled with sloppy theology. Uh, and, it's, and again, it's spread so quickly and so easily. Uh, and it's not just Facebook. Um, it's all sorts of things. So what do I mean by sloppy theology? We are all theologians. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are a theologian. Go do it. And I'll be like, no, you're not. No, you, we, are, we are all theologians. So theology is simply the study of God, right? And your own personal theology, which everybody has, sometimes your personal theology could be God doesn't exist. Right? That's your personal theology. Your personal theology is, is simply what you believe to be true about God. And, and almost every decision that, that you make is, is going to find its way back to what you believe to be true about God. What, what we wear, what we, where we work, how, you know, how we do our job, the relationships we're in, how we treat our, our spouses, how we treat our kids, how we spend our money, how we spend our free time. All these things are directly related to what we believe to be true about God. And so our, our personal theology informs that, and we're all theologians. Some of us are really good theologians. Theologians. We're not good at English, though. We're good theologians. Some of us are, are better theologians. And then, not us, of course, but there's people out there that are bad theologians. Uh, but we all are theologians on that level. And again, our theology informs nearly every decision we make. So, and, and good theology, by the way, it's not going to come as any surprise, comes from Scripture and no place else. So an example of good theology, you could say, well, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus is, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He, he is eternal. Uh, he stepped out of heaven, became man, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, rose again. He ascended. He sits at the Father's right hand. He intercedes for us. These are all, this is good theology. I believe in the Trinity. I believe God, Father, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're three distinct persons, but they're one God. They have separate roles, but they, th that's good theology. But there, there is also um, bad theology, and, and there's some, some, we're going to take a little test. A couple weeks ago, we took a test. I just like giving you guys tests. You did so well on it two weeks ago. So we're going to give ourselves another test to see if we have ever allowed sloppy theology to sneak into our mindset and the way we think, and, and, and that we've then allowed this this worldly wisdom maybe, or misinterpreted scripture to inform our personal theology and, and then where that can take us, okay? So be honest with yourself. Have you ever heard anybody say, or have you ever said, like heard anybody say and say, yeah, I like that, that's good. I, I think I'm gonna put that in my pocket and I'm gonna use that later. Or have you said this, this to somebody? And, and maybe it was to make them feel better. Maybe it was because it was on a Hallmark card, maybe because of whatever. But, but it's this, have you ever... Have you ever said or believed or, or, or you know, tried to give someone this uh, to comfort them or whatever? Just follow your heart. You ever said there's some, there's some heads nodding? There's some people going, going like that too. Uh, yeah? Just follow your heart. Why do we like that? Why do we like to say just follow your heart? Because it's Disney. Yeah, it is Disney. No offense, Disney. Yeah. I just have let it go in my head now. Thank you for that. Uh, we, we like that because... Um, we want to be able to trust our heart, right? We, we want to be able to say, oh yeah, yeah, follow your heart, that's good. In essence, what that is saying is do whatever you want, right? Because we're not going to say, you know, my heart really wants me to do this thing, but I don't want to do it. That doesn't make any sense at all. So when we say just follow your heart, we're saying do whatever you want. And, 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 and it, it assumes that our heart is good. And it, and it assumes that our heart is capable of making decisions. Decisions that we can trust and that we can, we can lean into and we can say, yeah, this is, this is a good thing to do. Uh, and I don't need to worry about it because my heart is telling me to do it. The reality, Jeremiah 17, 9, says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? So when we say, hey, follow your heart, we're saying, Hey, look, there's this part of you that is deceitful and wicked and it is incurable and no one can even understand it. You should go with that. Right? That's, that's what we're saying when we say follow your heart. But, but we mean it well, right? And the people who have told us that meant well. 
They, they, they wanted to, to give us comfort in that. But please, please, please don't follow your heart because it is deceitful above all things. The second one, uh, the second lie that we often tell ourselves and, and hear from people, um, maybe it's not as common as the other one, but, but I have had many people, Christian and non-Christian, tell me this. And, and think, have you ever said this? God never wants you to be unhappy. God never wants you to be unhappy. This is a great example of, of just sloppy theology, worldly wisdom kind of sneaking in. And it sounds good, you know. It, it, if, if, if you've got a friend who's just struggling with something, you know, oh, look, God doesn't want you to be unhappy. So what does that mean? Snap out of it? Like, how, how does that help? But, but we, we say that kind of thing. And, there, and there's some problems with this because if we truly believe that God doesn't want us to be unhappy, which is false, just to be clear, if we truly believe that God never wants us to be, happy, to be unhappy, then all sorts of things have to be true in addition to that. And what happens when you're unhappy? What happens when you find yourself, raise your hand again, if you've ever in your life, at any point for any reason, been unhappy? Got a couple of liars, liars in here. That's good. I, I can raise both hands as high as I... So, so if you truly believe that God never wants you to be unhappy there's come a point in your life where you said, well, my circumstances do not match my theology because I am unhappy. So we have to do something about it. We have to, we have to, to figure that out in our head. How does, how do, we have to rectify how does this true and this is true at the same time. And we're going to process that differently. I was talking to my friend, or to, to my friend Jake, who's sitting back there uh, just yesterday about this. I was talking to my wife about this uh, the other day about this. And, and how do you process this? You know, have you heard this before? Oh, yeah, yeah. So me personally... Um, if I, if I believed that God never wanted me to be unhappy, and there was, there was a time probably early on in, in my walk with the Lord that I believed that because I had some well-meaning friends tell me it, uh, well-meaning Christian friends tell me it, and, and, and so I thought, well, okay, it's got to be true because they know more than I do. And when I found myself unhappy, I thought, okay, so there's something at work here that is not of God because God wants me to be happy, and I'm not happy, so I have to combat this. I have to do something to change my situation because clearly God wants me to be happy, right? And so then we, when that's not true, we start working against God and what he's trying to accomplish in our life. And, and I, I asked Sarah, uh, you know, how, how do you process that? How would, how would that work in your mind? And, and she takes a different, this is, you may be really surprised to hear this, but she thinks differently than I do. It's crazy. And she says things that are much smarter than I do, so I write them down and steal them for sermons. So she said... She said, if she believed that God never wanted her to be unhappy and she found herself unhappy, her initial reaction would be, this is my fault. I have done something wrong. I have made a, a mistake and I'm to blame and God is disappointed. So, so we, we find ourselves unhappy. We wrongfully think that God doesn't like that, that his number one goal in our life is happiness, which is not true. God is far, far, far more concerned with our holiness than he is with our happiness. And we get that backwards all the time. So we find ourselves thinking, well, I've done something wrong because I'm in this situation. It's clearly not where God wants me. And that's a lie. It's not true. And then, and then another way we process that, um, my friend Jake was telling me, you know, he, he sees that and he says, okay, well, God wants me to be happy all the time. I'm not, ha I'm not happy. So God's not very big. God's not capable of doing what he wants. If he wants me to be happy and I'm not, then God is small. And I thought, man, I wouldn't think that. I would just think that I have to fix it, which means I'm bigger than God, which is ridiculous. And, and then you see your theology begins to, to, it causes problems and it begins to erode our perception of the very nature of God. And that is dangerous. It, when, when, our, when our thinking gets twisted like that and, and we start letting these things sneak in, it begins to erode our perception of the very nature of God. Last one, uh, last um, sloppy theology, bumper sticker theology that I think we're guilty of. And, and this one, I, I have been guilty of this one. It's been a long time, I can be honest, because uh, my, my theology was corrected. Um, but, but have you ever heard anybody say, and you thought, yeah, I'll take that and put that in my pocket and use it when life gets hard, or, 
I'm going to say this to somebody to make them feel better. And it's this. God will never give you more than you can handle. Thank you. <laughs> like, no, Kyle, you're the only one, you doofus. No. We, we, that's the, probably the most common one of these three. We say, God will never give you more than you can handle. And I can see some of you, like at the 730 service, you're like, that is true, isn't it? And you're looking it up. We say, God will never give you more than we can handle. And we love that. We love hearing that because it gives us comfort. It gives us a false comfort. It makes us think, well, okay, so whatever comes in life, I'll be okay. Whatever comes along in life, I can handle it. And I, I, you know, I, I've got this. And it is a, it is a complete, complete lie. Because the reality is, God will often give us more than we can handle. He will often give us more than we can handle. In fact, it is one of his favorite tools to to shape us and mold us to be more like his son and to strengthen our faith. Think back to the times in your life when you your your faith was strengthened. When when you came out the other side and you're like, man, I never thought I I'd, I'd be here. I never thought that I'd be able to to depend on God in this way. Those were likely times when God lovingly gave you more than you can handle. Because what happens when God gives us more than we can handle? What do, we, what do we have to do? We have to rely on him. We have to lean into him. And the heavier and heavier it gets, the more and more he gives us that we can't handle, the harder and harder we have to lean into him or we're going to be crushed. And he does it on purpose. He loves to do it. And the longer I walk with the Lord, the more convinced I am that he wants us to walk in a perpetual state of, God, I can't handle this. He wants us to to remain in this permanent state of, God, I can't handle this because we need to be leaning into him more and more constantly, right? So he wants us, he wants us to live there. And we, and we fight it with everything we we have because we think, we think that's uncomfortable. That's no good. That's not what, what we're supposed to be doing. But, but God wants to shape us. He wants to strengthen us and he wants to give us more than we, in fact, in fact, if we, if we can say, you know, the things that are going on in my life, I, I've got them. I can handle them. Right? If we can say that honestly, I, I, I can handle what God's put on my plate, then you're missing a plate. Then there's, there's something else that God has for you to be doing or handling or, or dealing with or, or, or working through or whatever it is. He's calling you to do something that you have not yet said yes to because he wants us to be at a place where we have to say to him, God, I can't handle this on my own. I need your strength to do it. I need your power to do it. I need, I need to lean into you and you have to get this done through me because, because I can't do it. And, and here's where we get that. We, we come up with this idea that God will never give us more than we can handle because we misinterpret 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And this might ring a bell. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. That's true. He won't let us be tempted beyond what he can bear. And that verse goes on to say, and when you are tempted, he provides a way out. You can escape from it. We twist that and we we think of, well, okay, God won't let me be tempted beyond what I can bear, which is true. And we we take that and we move it into trials in life, the trials that we go through and the difficulties. And we say, well, God's not going to give me more. No, he absolutely gives us more than we can bear because we need to rely and turn to him. It's one of God's favorite tools in growing our faith. All right. Now let's look at the text. Turn to Colossians chapter 2. And remember the background, remember the context. These these lies and sloppy theology is beginning to creep its way in. Uh, Worldly philosophies and empty deceit and and old Jewish traditions and all these things that are are, are starting to be, they're saying are being added to what is true of the gospel. It's very problematic, and Paul gets word of this, and so he writes this letter to the Colossian church. Starting in verse 1, chapter 2, he says, For for I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance and understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. 
For though I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. How did we receive Christ Jesus the Lord? In faith. How do we walk with him in faith? And then, and then verse 7, which is going to be our anchor for the next month. Rooted and built up in him and established in faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to the human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Paul is saying it is all about Jesus. It is all about Jesus. It's not Jesus plus, it's not Jesus and, it's not this plus Jesus, blah, blah, blah. It's Jesus. It is what Jesus did on the cross and nothing more. And we, we, we find, oftentimes we find ourselves, you know, we, we, we come to the cross and maybe we say, okay, I said a prayer, you know, and, and I meant it, I meant it. And I gave my life to the Lord and, and it, it's good and it's real and it's all good. But then, but then we leave the cross and we, we believe it. You know, it's, it's in our history. It's in our back of our mind. We, we believe that's true. But we leave that to go find wisdom and knowledge of God elsewhere. Well, we're not going to find any wisdom or knowledge of God from a psychic. I have a, a cousin who claims to be a Christian, and they go to a psychic all the time. What? That doesn't even make sense. Oh, well, well, the psychic knows things that can tell me. That's demonic, sorry, I'm just going to be honest. And, and, and we're not going to find wisdom and knowledge of God in our horoscope. We're not going to find it. I have another friend who I actually unfriended on Facebook, who, I know that's crazy, you can do that? And, and, and they... Claim to be a Christian. I say claimed, not because I doubt their salvation, but I just don't know enough about them to, to be able to say that with you know, any, any confidence. But they, they claim to be a Christian, and, and every day they'd post their horoscope, and they'd mix it in with you know, pseudo-spiritual things, and then a scripture verse out of context here. And, and they had been led astray. They'd been led astray. And, and Paul is saying, there is no wisdom, there is no knowledge of God outside of Jesus Christ. It's not there. We're gonna, uh, so verse two, verse two, take a look at that. It says, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna look at verse two and verse six. Because um, there's, there's, a, there's a lot in that. Verse two says, complete understanding and knowing the mystery of God. That mystery is Jesus Christ in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's not, it's not that Jesus is part of the truth. Right? If you have a bucket of truth, you, don't, you can't put Jesus in the bucket and then, and then, oh, there's this and there's this and there's this and there's just these different things that we can, I'm going to form my theology and my, my framework of God from all of these things in the bucket and I'm going to put Jesus in the bucket. That, we can't do that. John 14, 6 says what? It says, Jesus is talking, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life and no man comes to the Father but through me. He's the truth. He's it. It's all found in him. It's, it starts and ends in Jesus Christ. It starts and end, it ends in Jesus Christ. There's nowhere else to go to find it. In verse 6, uh, it says, As you receive Christ Jesus, so walk in him. And how do we receive him again? By faith. And we walk with him in faith. And Paul is telling them this so that the truth that they have received is not, not being perverted. We, we have to remember that the gospel that saves us is the gospel that sanctifies us. It's not, it's not just I said a prayer and I'm saved. We then walk in that. We then grow in that. We become rooted in that. And, and, we, and we live our life in Jesus Christ. And the same gospel that saves us is the gospel that sanctifies us. Okay, so how do we, how do we combat sloppy theology? How do we protect ourselves? How do we, how do we go against this this, the fact that, that we are in a culture that, that is just riddled with bumper sticker theology and, and, and these little pithy sayings. Um, I have a picture of a tree. There you go. That's the answer. That's how you combat it. Let's pray. Amen. No. <laughs> that is not super helpful. This tree is awesome. Um, does anybody know what kind of tree this is? 
I, 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 you'll, you'll feel silly here in a minute. It's called a Boschia albatrunca. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, I got one in my yard. Duh. A Boschia albatrunca. This is a Boschia albatrunca tree. I'm probably saying that wrong, but fortunately you guys don't know. And, and it's predominantly found in um, Southern Africa. And it looks like a normal tree, right? It looks like a tree you'd find, you know, pretty much anywhere. But it's not, it's, it's quite a remarkable tree. If you Google, go to Google Images, type in Boschia albatrunca. It's like the third or fourth, I don't know how to spell it either. I'm sure I've, I've spelled it phonetically so I could say it right. <laughs> so, so this is definitely wrong. But if you type it in, you're gonna get a bunch of pictures of it. This is one of the pictures. Another picture of it has, has a herd of goats in the tree. I thought it was hilarious, but I chose not to use it today because I'd be too distracted. Uh, but so apparently goats love to climb this tree as well. But this tree is, is uh, it's a remarkable tree it thrives in conditions that most trees can't grow in. It, it can grow in soil that is full, full with lime, and, and lime, if you, if you know much about uh, horticulture, it's difficult to grow things in lime. It likes to destroy roots and, and, and uh, kill, kill plants. It can grow in soil that's, that's uh, got a high lime concentration. It can grow in soil that's very, very rocky and, uh, and, and you know, riddled with... Um, things that are not nutritious and there's just low dirt and all, you know, it's, it can grow in those uh, conditions and it can also grow in, in, in brackish low-lying areas where there's a lot of water and a lot of just standing water and mold and all these things. It, it, it's like, how can a, a tree grow in all these different conditions? But it can. And the average uh, Boschilla albatrunca tree grows 20 feet high. The tallest one that we know of is 30 feet, which is not really all that impressive, but 20 feet 20 feet high is the average height of this tree. And the locals call it the shepherd tree, which I thought was, was kind of interesting, the shepherd tree. Here's the thing about the shepherd tree. I'm going to draw a picture. And if you, I know you guys can't see it, but we're going to try to put it up on the screen. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> woo <-hoo. That's... laughs> I immediately regretted that decision. I took a lot of art classes before I was a believer I was going to be a, an artist. I'm not kidding. I know it's funny. But as soon as I got saved, God took my ability to draw away from me. <laughs> I'm serious. All I can do is goofy cartoons now. I, it's really sad and embarrassing. Uh, but I've been practicing and, and I, I figured out how to draw uh, this shepherd tree. So um, prepare to be wowed. So... Uh, I'm going to draw this to scale, okay? This is the ground, and this is, a, this is our, our little favorite shepherd tree here. This is our little trunk. It's a pretty good trunk right there, isn't it? You zoom in on that, that's a pretty good trunk. All right. There's some goats. <laughs> that one went past you and came back and got you. All right, so this is our shepherd's tree. And this is, this is 20 feet high, okay? This is to scale, I promise. I measured it. The roots of, of this shepherd's tree is what makes this tree remarkable. The roots of this tree is what makes it stand out. The shepherd tree has the deepest root system of any tree we have ever found. And the roots of this tree go down whoa i can see myself draw look at that they go down pretty deep in fact they go down two hundred and twenty feet into the earth and that, that is to scale, I promise. I measured it. I have a ruler over there. 220 feet. This is what a root looks like, so we're making sure that nobody thinks it's... I can't even really wrap my head around that. You know, if I see a tree that's 20 feet, that's 20 feet high, you know, I, I assume that the, that the roots go down, I don't know, 20 feet, maybe 30 feet. I can't really wrap my head around that, that depth. If I were to see... Like, I feel bad for the poor sucker that had to dig this thing up in order to, to tell us, hey, it's 220 feet. 
But, but this, is what, this, is, this is the root system of, of this shepherd tree. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. It's the, it's the deepest root of any tree God has created that we have discovered thus far. That tree is rooted. This is the definition of a tree that's rooted, right? When Paul said, hey, be rooted in Jesus, this is a really good picture of what it means to be rooted. What, what happens when a storm comes by and hits this tree? You're out, you're, you're out on the plains. Did you see the goats will fly out of it? Is that what you said? <laughs> That's my joke, dude. You totally... It's true, the goats will go flying right out of it. <laughs> Even the fat ones. So, so if, if this tree is out on the plains, you know, in, in, in southern Africa, and a storm comes flying through, after the goats fall out of it, the tree is going to be fine. Nothing's going to happen to the tree. It's just, it's just a breeze because this tree has roots that go down 220 feet. No matter what's raging up here, it is calm down here. There's nothing that's going to be getting to this, right? It is calm down here. No matter what hectic, crazy storms that are being thrown at this thing, the bulk of this tree doesn't even notice because it's so deeply rooted. So what happens in our lives when we are rooted in Christ like this tree is rooted in the ground? What happens? I want you to write this down. If you take notes, you can turn the back of your bulletin there. Just write down what begins to happen when we are truly rooted, rooted in Jesus. What begins to happen when we are truly rooted in Jesus? If, our, if we have deep roots. First, we are protected. I actually put this. We protect ourselves from being taken captive. We protect ourselves from being taken captive. By what? By fancy arguments, philosophy, human traditions, and empty deceit. We're protected from that. Not because of our brilliance and wisdom, but because we've allowed the Holy Spirit to shape us and change us and inform our theology the way it should be according to scripture and truth. And so when we hear things like, God always wants you to be happy, we say, that's not true. God doesn't always want me to be happy because God is more concerned with my holiness than he is my happiness. So when we hear these lies, we're protected from, from that, those lies and the empty, the empty deceit in human tradition. When, when someone says to us, well, God will never give you more than you can handle, we can say, no, he will give me more than I can handle. I see that he's doing it right now because he's giving me an opportunity to grow. And so instead of running from what God's given us, we're protected from that and we lean into God and we grow. That's the first thing that happens when we root ourselves in Jesus. And it is an awesome thing. Second thing that happens when we begin to root ourselves in Jesus. We are, write this down, we are able to stand strong through storms. We're able to stand strong through storms. When life storms come at us and they come at us all the time, we can stand strong. Because underneath, below the surface, it's calm. Right? That storm can't hit beneath the surface. It's protected down there. You're rooted in Jesus. When that storm comes, it's all right. Because he's got it. I'm rooted in him. When God gives you more than you can handle, you're thankful for it. Say, all right, let's do this. You got something going on. That's the second thing that happens when we root ourselves in Jesus. We, 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 don't, we don't eliminate God's favorite tool for shaping us and for strengthening our faith when we do that. And, the, and uh, oh, this, I want to tell you this story. This is cool. So, okay. When we, about three months ago, I think it was, there was a storm that came through Hagerstown. Uh, we live up off of Robinwood. And uh, this storm came through, and, and I went and sat on the back patio to watch the storm go through. Uh, and, and it was a decent storm. It wasn't, you know, this terrifying, scary one. It was, but it was, it, was, it was decent. It was thunder and lightning and all that and wind going. But we have two big pine trees in the back that are very, very dead. And I was waiting for them to come falling over, but they didn't fall over. So this gives you a sort of a sense of how, you know, the storm was good enough to watch, but not good enough to knock over two dead pine trees, right? So the next morning, after the storm, I'm driving into the church, and I take, I take a different way that I don't normally go. I went up Jefferson and around. I think I was probably going to Sheets. 
and uh, it's the fastest way to get to it. And nothing wrong with that, right? That's a good thing. And uh, and so, but I'm driving down the road, and and there's this old house with this old oak tree that that stood in the in the side yard. And this this oak tree was a huge oak tree. It had it had fallen over. It had toppled over, and it was laying. It was laying out across the, the yard, and just last week they started cutting it up. It's been laying there for a long time. And this, it was huge. I, I would not be able to get my arms around it, not even close. And, and you know, it, it hit the ground, and there's this giant root ball, you know, that pulled up out of the ground, and it had to be 10 feet high at least. Uh, now it's all kind of eroded down, so it's not super high, but when it first happened, I mean, it was this tall, giant root ball, and this huge, sturdy, so I thought, oak tree laying on the ground. And when you look at that root system, it was really wide. It was really wide, but, but it wasn't very deep. It, it could have been deep at some point, but somewhere along the line, those roots began to erode or the damage sunk in. Some, somehow those roots uh, were damaged to the point where they couldn't sustain the tree anymore, Right? And, and that, that tree came toppling down. The day before that, you'd drive by that tree and you'd think, that's a good tree to put a, a tree fort in or put, a, you know, put a, a tire swing in. That's a perfect tree for that because on the outside, it looked great. On the outside, there's nothing wrong. I mean, if you, if you had a trained eye, maybe you could go and you could find some disease or some issue with it. But driving through, just, oh yeah, that's a, that's a huge oak tree. That's great. You'd think there's nothing wrong with it. But again, somewhere along the line, those roots got damaged and the tree came over. And the reality here is the biggest, strongest looking trees can come crashing down if the roots don't run deep. The biggest, strongest trees that look great on the outside in the smallest of storms can come crashing down if the roots don't run deep. And this is true for us. This is true as we, as we walk with the Lord. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what position you hold. You can say, well, I'm a pastor, or I'm a, you know, I'm, I, I, I do this at the church, I do that at the church, I'm, I'm a CEO, you know, I, I, I'm a big deal at my company, I'm a big deal in my family, I'm a big deal at my church, whatever it would be. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter how much money's in the bank. It doesn't matter what people call you. It doesn't matter your title. It doesn't matter any of that. That's all, that's all up here. You could have an oak tree this tall and say, well, that looks really good. What matters is below the surface, Right? What matters is down here. And if you're not rooted, if we are not rooted as individuals and as a congregation, as a church, FCF is not rooted in Christ, the smallest of storms is going to knock us over. The smallest of storms can knock us over. But we are rooted. We are rooted in Christ. FCF has is, is always been rooted in Christ. It always will be rooted in Christ. That's not going to change. I guarantee that that's not going to change. It's what we're about. It's what we're here for. And that's what we're going to go over for the next uh, four weeks, like I said. But, but just the spiritual lesson in that, when I saw that tree, immediately God started doing weird things in my funky brain and said, hey, Kyle, there's a spiritual lesson in this. I'm like, that's a huge tree. How did it fall? It wasn't rooted. So third, the third thing, the third thing that happens when we begin to root ourselves in Jesus this one's crazy. This one took me forever to figure out. You're going you're to be like, I don't know if that's true. The third thing that happens when we root ourselves in Jesus, we grow. We grow. That's crazy, isn't it? Who would have thought? Who would have thought? What does a plant need or a, an individual mean, need to grow? What do we need? We need food and water, right? We need food and water to grow. It is no coincidence it is no coincidence that Jesus is a living water and the bread of life because there's nothing outside of Jesus that we need to grow, right? He is sufficient. He is all we need to grow. We root ourselves in the King of Kings. We root ourselves in Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and we grow because he's all we need to sustain us. Amen? I'm going to get all worked up in here, man. We're going to be Baptist in five minutes. No offense to Baptist, that's totally cool. So we begin to grow. That's the third thing that happens. So, so I'm going I'm to end with this. I'm going to end with this, uh, 
this passage. So how do, we, how do we grow? How do we do it? And we're going to explore that over the next four weeks. What's this going to look like? What it looks like as a church? What it look like, looks like as individuals? But very simply, we trust God's word. We, we believe that it's true. And we, and we lean into him when it's difficult. When we don't understand, we still trust him. We still lean into him. When things don't make sense, when that, when that storm is raging, we, we rely on the promises that he's given us. And when we do that, our, ro- our roots begin, begin to, to grow deeper. And Romans 12, 1 and 2, spells it out for us. It says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. And here it is, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We, we find all truth and knowledge and wisdom pertaining to God in the Bible. It is nowhere else. And Jesus, it, it, it all, it, it begins and ends with Jesus, who is the word made flesh. It begins and ends with Jesus. So I can simply say to you, oh, just read the Bible and pray, right? And that'll, that'll grow your roots. It's, that's true. We need to read the Bible and pray, but but what does that mean? What does that look like? It's not just about behavior modification and doing something. I'll add this to my schedule. It's not that. Um, it's about actually building a relationship with the God of the universe. And, and we hear that and we think, well, yeah, I know that. That should blow your mind. The God of the universe wants, wants a, a real intimate relationship with you, not the person next to you, with you. And we can do that. And his primary way of communicating with us is through the scripture. If you were to watch me do a quiet time, you would probably call the police because you'd think I'm crazy. Now I'm going out on a limb here. You're gonna, I'm, you, you, can, you can make fun of me all you want later on. I understand that. Don't tell anybody outside of this building. When I do a quiet time, um, I, I, don't, I don't look scholarly. Like I don't sit there you know, in a, in a smoker's robe and a coffee and, you know, read my, I don't, I don't do that. That's just not me. There's nothing wrong with that. But, but when, I, when I do my quiet time, if, I, if I'm doing it here in the office, I shut my door so that nobody makes fun of me. Uh, I do it at home. I do it after everybody goes to bed. Um, so my wife doesn't just run out of the room screaming. Uh, what I, I set it, I set it on, usually I do it on the floor. If I do it on, the, you know, sitting at my desk, I'll set it down and and when I'm reading, when I'm reading scripture, I'm, I'm, I'm really like, I'm picturing Jesus there with me just because I do that and, and I'm goofy. Um, and he is also, that's why I do it. Uh, he's right there with me. Um, and I, and I'll, I'll sit down and say, I'll say, God, be with me as I read your word. Show me what it means. Show me how it applies to my life. T- tell me, tell me how, to, how, how this works itself out in me I don't want to just look at this as an academic pursuit, right? This is, this is, I'm reading a book written by my best friend to me, and, and it's not a normal book, right? So I sit down and I say, God, you show me this, and, and then when I read, I have dyslexia, so I, I read, my mouth moves, you know, when I'm, when I'm reading, I'm, I'm like, and, uh, and it's, it's really goofy, but I, I'm used to it now, and, and so I'm doing that, and then when I get to a part that I don't, understand or I don't like, I'll stop and I'll just go, really, God? Really? Do I, seriously, did you put this in? I'm going to read it again. Maybe I misunderstood it. And, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll say that and I'll just say, God, I don't, I don't like this. I don't, I don't like that part. Or, or I get to a part where, have you ever, have you ever been reading scripture and there's, you just need something that, that day? You just feel like you're at the end of your rope and, and it just pops off the page at you? You know, that, that happens and I, and I Many times I've, I've put my hands up and I said, I, I was like, yes, and I, and I didn't whisper it. <laughs> and, and I'm sure people are like, what in the world? And, and, and I interact with God while I'm trying to, 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 to read the scriptures because, it, because the, the word of God is living and active, right? And, and when we sit there and read it, if we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts, he's going to make these words pop. He's going to show us where in our life it applies. He's going to, he, it, it, it can divide our heart and, 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 and with surgical precision. 
and, and show us the truth of God. Like, no, there's nothing else that can do that. There's nothing else that can do that. So how do, we, how do we root ourselves in Jesus? We trust him. We trust his word is true. We lean into him. We, we follow him. We trust him even when it doesn't make sense. And all that, get, get the, the, the food and water is all Jesus, right? The bread of life and the living water. And we spend time with him in his scriptures and in prayer. Not as an academic pursuit, but as a relationship that we build. That's how it's done. Amen. Let's pray.